Nobody knows who did it first. In my opinion, the cryptocurrency industry represents the largest Ponzi scheme in history. 12 months ago, we reported accusations. Perth businessman Chris Marco was running an elaborate Ponzi racket. Keep in mind that sources tell CBS News that the Securities and Exchange Commission made inquiries into his alleged involvement in a, quote, fraudulent Ponzi scheme, victimizing hundreds of investors. The con man behind the biggest Ponzi scheme in history decided to speak out from his prison cell. Now, state investigators say he told people he was investing their money in the stock market, but instead was wagering millions of dollars of that money at casinos, according to authorities. Swindlers have been pulling off the scam for centuries, paying existing investors with the deposits of new ones to create the illusion of an incredibly profitable investment opportunity. Before 1920, it was known as robbing Peter to pay Paul, or the Peter to Paul scheme. In 1884, former President Ulysses S. Grant fell victim to such a scheme that left him penniless. But it was Charles Ponzi, who in Boston in 1920, earned permanent naming rights to the scheme by dazzling the investing public and dumbfounding authorities like no other. Charles Ponzi was born Carlo Pietro Giovanni Guglielmo Tempaldo Ponzi on March 3, 1882, in the town of Lugo in northern Italy. His parents, Oreste and Imelda Ponzi, were part of a wealthy Italian family that had become borderline poor by the time he was born. His parents sent Carlo to the University of Rome with just enough money to earn a degree and high hopes he would use it to prosper and restore the family to its erstwhile rank in society. Carlo dashed any such hopes. He loved college, 500 miles from home, but not for the education. There he enjoyed the life of a bon vivant, skipping classes and befriending students from more privileged families. He spent much of his money on fine dining and equally fine clothing, and by picking up more bar tabs than books. As a result, after four years, Ponzi was forced to leave with no money and no degree. During his university years, he had heard stories of other Italians who went off to America to find fame and fortune and decided that this was the only course left open for him. He left Italy on November 1903 with $200 in his pocket. He arrived in Boston with $2.50, the balance in the pockets of card sharps who earned their living from unsuspecting immigrants on ships. Ponzi found making money in America rather harder than he'd expected. For nearly four years, he worked as a grocery clerk, factory hand, dishwasher, waiter, and painter. He did repair work, folded laundry, and anything else to keep food in his belly. He took the first name Charles and a variety of surnames other than his own, including Bianchi and Ponce. After moving to several cities, including Pittsburgh, New York, New Haven, and Providence, he ended up in Montreal, Canada. There, a man by the name of Louis Zorossi hired him as a bank clerk after a five-minute interview. He fit right in at Banco Zorossi, which did a booming business catering to the Italian immigrant community and paying 6% interest to depositors three times the rate other banks offered. He lost that job when the bank went under. As was often the case with Ponzi, he turned back to crime, which resulted in a three-year stretch in prison in Quebec for forgery. After release, he began helping smuggle Italian immigrants into the United States this was followed by two more years in prison in Atlanta after getting caught at that endeavor. Upon release, he wandered the Southeast U.S. for the next five years working at a variety of jobs. Bookkeeper, translator, painter, librarian, 
before finding himself back in Boston. There, in 1917, Ponzi landed a most promising job as a clerk for the J.R. Poole Company, an import-export firm. His job was to keep track of foreign operations. The starting pay of $16 a week was not great, but soon rose to $25 and then $50. Ponzi, now 35 years old, noticed a young girl on a streetcar platform. Her name was Rose Nieko, the daughter of a produce merchant, and in February 1918, they were married. Rose enjoyed their modest, newlywed lifestyle, but Ponzi was determined to make her the wife of a millionaire. I want you to be able to throw away a hundred dollars, he told her. In September 1918, Ponzi quit his job at J.R. Poole to help run his father-in-law's failing produce business. Ponzi was confident he could turn things around and turn the shop into a commercial empire with himself at the helm. Instead, the business quickly went into bankruptcy. Ponzi found himself again out of work, but not out of ideas for getting rich, this time as a commodities broker. Unfortunately, the first commodity he tried to sell apparently belonged to someone else. In May 1919, authorities served Ponzi a warrant for stealing 5,387 pounds of cheese. As the investigation got underway, Ponzi feared that once authorities learned of his two prison sentences, he might be deported. He feared, too, that Rose would learn of his criminal past in the mistaken belief she did not already know. Ponzi then decided to publish an international trade publication he called The Trader's Guide, in which advertisers would pay for listings seen in every corner of the world. So confident was Ponzi in his new scheme that he rented office space, bought $350 of furniture, and hired a small staff. To keep their operation afloat, he applied for a loan at the Hanover Trust Company, but the bank's president turned him down personally. Ponzi returned to his office and laid off his staff. Not long after the demise of the Trader's Guide, Ponzi received a letter from a Spanish company requesting an advertising catalog. Inside the envelope, he found an international reply coupon, a type of voucher accepted in various other countries in exchange for local postage stamps. Ponzi quickly realized the money-making potential of taking advantage of exchange rate differences to buy IRCs in one country and redeem them in another. Staring at the coupon, Ponzi at last realized how he could make millions. And this time, he was right. At this point, Ponzi had discovered a practice known as arbitrage the simultaneous purchase and sale of an asset in two different markets. Tiny differences in price allow for a modest profit. In this case, buying IRCs in Italy for one price and exchanging them for higher priced postage stamps in the US would create significant profit when done at scale. If Ponzi had stopped there, he likely would have been free and clear. In 1920, Ponzi organized a company called Securities Exchange Company, in which he sold stock advertising 50% interest after 90 days. The funds obtained from investors were supposed to be used to buy IRCs to redeem them in the U.S. Instead, Ponzi used funds obtained from new investors to pay off old investors. By way of explaining why he did this, Ponzi blamed the Universal Postal Union for suspending the sale of IRCs once it learned about his coupon redemption scheme. After attempting to get around the suspension, Ponzi shifted to his Rob Peter to Pay Paul scheme. For a while, it worked. He raked in $8.5 million in the first eight months of 1920. 
He kept the scheme going by telling investors he had created an elaborate network of agents buying IRCs for him overseas that he could redeem in the U.S. for a tidy profit. In fact, there was no elaborate network of coupon buyers. He was using new investments to pay off old investors. It had taken nearly 17 years, but by June 1920, Charles Ponzi had at last made good on his promise to his mother. Now a very rich man, he sent her first-class tickets to sail to America. Imelda arrived to join the Ponzi's in their life of American aristocracy at a newly decorated mansion in the affluent town of Lexington, Massachusetts. In July 1920, the Boston Post ran a flattering front-page feature on Ponzi, pegging his net worth at $8.5 million. Less than a week later, the U.S. Post Office Department announced new conversion rates for international postal reply coupons, though officials said the rate change had nothing to do with Ponzi. Investigations of Ponzi ensued but made little progress until the Boston Post launched its own investigation, which generated bad press, causing Ponzi to decline to accept new investments. This caused a run by current investors, and Ponzi reportedly paid out more than a million dollars. In the days that followed, hundreds of investors registered their names as victims, hoping to recover some of their losses they were aided by numerous more fortunate investors, ones who had received payouts from Ponzi and kindly returned their ill-gotten gains. In the end, roughly 20,000 victims were awarded refunds of just under 40% of their investments. Thousands more got nothing but a costly lesson. Charles Ponzi was convicted on federal mail fraud charges and sentenced to five years of prison. In May 1921, while Ponzi enjoyed the nice view of Cape Cod Bay from the Plymouth County Jail, the Boston Post's publisher, Robert Grosier, won a Pulitzer Prize for his courage and fine sense of newspaper honor in exposing Ponzi. Charles Ponzi's mail fraud sentence was reduced by one year for good behavior. Upon his release in 1925, state prosecutors took their turn and secured another conviction and prison sentence of seven to nine years. While on bail, awaiting his return to jail and confident he would win an appeal, Ponzi went to Florida and hatched a brand new investment scheme, this time in real estate and this time offering investors a 200% return in 60 days. Florida officials quickly shut it down and arrested him. He was sentenced to one year in prison for violating state securities laws. Out on appeal for this latest charge, Ponzi decided he could not bear the thought of returning to prison, so he disappeared. With a nationwide manhunt underway, he used his fluent Italian and years of experience as a manual laborer to secure a job as a waiter and dishwasher aboard an Italian freighter. Disguised by a mustache and shaved head, he decided to end the manhunt by faking suicide, asking friends to put some of his clothes and a suicide note on a Florida beach. The ship set sail from Tampa and Charles Ponzi, now using the alias Andrea Luciana, was again a free man. It was a perfect escape, almost. After revealing his true identity to a shipmate, Ponzi was in time met by authorities in New Orleans who placed him under arrest. Taken back to Massachusetts, Ponzi served seven years in prison and then having never obtained U.S. citizenship, was promptly deported.
Back home in Italy, Ponzi struggled to make ends meet doing odd jobs. He spent two years writing in his autobiography, but failed to find an American publisher. He moved to Brazil in 1939 to take a job for the Italian state airline. When that job fizzled, he operated a small rooming house and taught English in Rio de Janeiro, where, following a steep decline in health, he died in 1949 in a charity hospital in Brazil with a net worth of $75. Charles Ponzi was the most flamboyant early practitioner of a scheme where the fraudster creates a plausible investment, gathers investors, then uses the money from older investors to pay off newer ones while raking in a tidy profit. The Oxford English Dictionary would later cement the term Ponzi scheme into the lexicon with its definition. A form of fraud in which belief in the success of a non-existent enterprise is fostered by the payment of quick returns to the first investors from money invested by later investors. Ponzi scheme was also not the largest in history. That honor, so far, goes to Bernie Madoff, famously arrested in 2008 for defrauding investors of an estimated $65 billion over the course of 16 years, using the same basic ruse of paying off early investors using proceeds from new ones. And in the time since Madoff's conviction, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission has enforced actions against more than 50 similar schemes. And those are just the ones authorities have managed to find.